Welcome back, everyone. Our goal today is for us to talk about how to handle elliptic curves in CoCalc, and how to interpret what CoCalc says about elliptic curves when you ask it nicely about the various sorts of things we've talked about. So we're going to start by talking about elliptic curves over Q, which is what we talked about first, and then we're going to move in and we'll do some examples over finite fields as well. So as our basic example today, let's start with the curve y squared equals x cubed minus 2x plus 21. So this is just a somewhat random curve that I happen to choose. And let's go ahead and pull up a co-calc window and see how we would get co-calc to think about this curve. Remember that when we're defining an elliptic curve, we're really thinking about two numbers. So when I wrote y squared equals x cubed minus 2x plus 21 to be the equation of this curve, really the only things that I'm using are the minus 2 and the plus 21. And in fact, in order to generate an elliptic curve in co-calc, you really only need to give it those two numbers. So I enter this command, e equals elliptic curve, parentheses, brackets, minus 2, comma 21. e is just the name I'm giving to the curve. And then if I ask Sage to tell me what e is, Sage will happily tell me, yes, this is the elliptic curve with equation y squared equals x cubed minus 2x plus 21 over the field of rational numbers, so meaning over q. That is exactly what we wanted. Great. Now, what kinds of things are we going to want to do with this elliptic curve? Well, to start with, we might want to do things like add points or multiply points. So let's just look for points on this curve. And so one point you might notice here is that if x is minus 3, the right-hand side here turns into minus 27 plus 6 plus 21, which is 0. So one point here will be minus 3 comma 0. And another point you might notice here is that if I take x to be 2, then I'll get 8 minus 4 plus 21. That is 25. So I could take x is 2 and y is 5. So to tell Sage we want to think about these points, we need to enter the points, x coordinate, then y coordinate, and we need to put an e in front. Remember, e is just the name we gave our elliptic curve. If you'd called it something else, you would need to write something different. But here, for example, in order to define p, I'm just going to write p equals e of minus 3, 0. Now, do note that Sage is intelligent about this. So if you try and, for example, enter a point that's not actually on the curve, it will correctly yell at you. Now, once you've told Sage you are thinking of these as points on this elliptic curve, you perform the operations with them exactly like you'd think. So, for example, if I type P plus Q, it will just add the points on the elliptic curve for me. And so we see, for example, that P plus Q is the point 2 minus 5, and then there's this 1. And so I wanted to remind you, Sage is always going to write coordinates of points, what it calls projectively. So that is the point that we would write as 2 minus 5. Sage is always going to want to write as 2 minus 5, 1. And these colons here are just a way of saying that it is writing it in that form. But whenever Sage is talking about a point, you can just mentally translate it back to our way of thinking about things by just taking off this colon 1 at the end and changing this colon to a comma. So these two are just different ways of writing the same thing. The advantage of Sage's notation is that it gives us a more mathematical way to refer to our pointed infinity or our identity point O. Namely, Sage will always write the point O as 0, 1, 0. And so when Sage is talking about the points on a curve, there's really two types of them. There's points that are O, in which case Sage will write exactly 0, 1, 0. And for all other points, this third coordinate here that Sage invents will just be 1. Now, note that although Sage will always present these things to you in this notation, Sage will be perfectly happy for you to describe points in the notation that we're familiar with, as we did here when we were defining P and Q. So that won't be a problem. So all of this is by way of saying that what we've learned here is that P plus Q is the point that we would write as 2 minus 5. 
Now, if I want to add p to itself, I could write p plus p, or I can write 2 times p. And you'll see that 2 times p now is giving me the point 0, 1, 0. And that, remember, is the point O. If you look back at what p is, p is a point on the x-axis. And so remember, whenever we add a point on the x-axis to itself, we're supposed to get the point O. So Sage correctly knows how to handle all of these fringe cases of how we add points on elliptic curves. If you instead took 2 times q, then what you would see is that 2 times q is actually this thing we called p before. And so what that means is if I keep adding q to itself, I'm going to end up stuck in a loop pretty quickly. Note this underscore, by the way, just stands for the answer to the previous calculation. So here I'm just taking whatever the previous output was and adding q to it repeatedly, and you'll see we get stuck into this loop very quickly. And so what we've learned here is, in fact, both of these points are torsion points. This point is torsion of period 2. And this point is torsion of period 4. So we've really so far nailed down, in fact, four torsion points on this curve. P, Q, this point which is actually just minus Q, and of course O. We might naturally wonder if there's any other torsion points on the curve, and fortunately Sage can do that for us. Remember, this is something we actually explained completely how to do algorithmically, all in terms of the Nagel-Lutz theorem and the rational root theorem. But Sage can do it for us. To do that, we just ask Sage what the torsion points of E are, and it will just spit out a list. And so it turns out that we actually just already found all of the torsion points of our curve. Now, we might wonder if this is actually all of the points of our curve or not. And remember, that's really a question about the rank. So the way that works, remember, is that if the curve is rank 0, that means all points are torsion. And rank bigger than 0 means not all points are torsion. Or alternatively, you could phrase it as there are infinitely many points. But fortunately, we can ask Sage, hey, what's the rank of this curve? And Sage will happily tell us that the rank of this curve is 1. Which, of course, means that there are other solutions to this equation that we haven't found yet. But, remember, the rank being 1 means there's one single solution that you could write down that, together with the torsion points we already wrote down, would give us all of the points on the curve. We can even ask Sage what that point is by using the command .gens, which just stands for generators. And so we will see here that the points on E are generated by the torsion points together with the single point 615. Now, I should mention these commands, the dot rank and dot gens, will work well on elliptic curves where the rank is small, and particularly where the A and B from the defining equation are small. You will certainly run into curves that will break Sage pretty quickly if you start trying to enter larger numbers and asking these questions. In particular, there is no algorithmically known way to prove the rank of a lot of large rank curves. So you're not going to be able to find some really humongous rank curve and then have Sage just tell you, oh yeah, definitely this is this, is this rank and I've calculated it for you. Uh, so be warned about that. Uh, and if you experiment around, you'll get to find all sorts of interesting error messages that will tell you things about tate shafarevich groups and all manner of other things. Now, our point addition example before wasn't very impressive, so let's go ahead and now take this generator, I'm going to call it R, and let's look at what happens when we add this point to itself repeatedly. And so you can see the pattern that we experienced when we started looking at solutions to these sorts of equations by hand and adding them to themselves repeatedly, and they went from nice integral solutions to, well, we'll say less nice rational solutions and sort of rapidly ballooned up, you'll see we can subject Sage to the same thing and see that these points indeed get worse and worse and worse, as we kind of have come to expect at this point. 
Speaking of nice integer solutions, we can also just ask Sage, hey, what are all the integer solutions to this particular elliptic curve? And it's a result we briefly mentioned in class, but I'll reiterate it here. All elliptic curves have only a finite number of integral points. And if you're lucky, Sage will be able to find them. If Sage can't find them, it will tell you. Now, I will note when Sage is giving you the integral points on an elliptic curve, it will only give you one out of the pair of points that are mirrored across the x-axis. So in particular, out of that pair, it will only give you the one with none negative y-coordinate. And so we saw, for example, that both 2, 5 and 2, minus 5 are points on this curve, Sage only lists 2, 5 because Sage knows that we know that as soon as 2, 5 is an integral solution, so is 2 minus 5. You can see here that in fact there's another integer point that we haven't seen yet, namely this point 1770. But then that's the whole list for this particular curve. One famous problem in number theory that ends up being related to elliptic curves is what's called the congruent number problem. And this isn't really one problem. It's really a problem for every positive integer. And so the question here really is, for a particular positive integer n, is there a right triangle, all of whose side lengths are rational, whose area is n? That's the question. And so you could ask this for each n. So for example, if you choose n equals 6, this is actually the easiest one, because if you took the right triangle whose side lengths are 3, 4, and 5, then the area of this triangle is half of 3 times 4, which is 6. And so when the answer to this question is yes, we say n is a congruent number. So 6 is a congruent number. This example, though, makes this problem out to be a little nicer than it actually is. Because if I ask you if 5 is a congruent number, you might think through the right triangles that you know and convince yourself, okay, I don't know one where n is 5. Uh, but that's just because you've never before thought about the triangle whose side lengths are 20 over 3, 3 over 2, and 41 over 6. In order to check that this is really a right triangle, you have to use the Pythagorean theorem. So you have to check that 20 over 3 squared plus 3 over 2 squared is the same thing as 41 over 6 squared. But I'll leave it to you to convince yourself of that. And then to convince yourself that it really has area 5, you just have to take 20 over 3 and multiply it by 3 over 2, and then multiply that by a half and see that the answer you get is in fact 5. It turns out that actually whether a particular number is congruent or not is connected very closely to a related elliptic curve. Namely, a number n is congruent if and only if the rank of the elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed minus n squared x is greater than or equal to 1. The proof of this theorem is a pretty far way away from what I want to talk about today, but the nice thing is, if we have Sage available to us, we can use Sage to check whether any particular number is congruent by looking at these elliptic curves and checking their rank. So, for example, if I want to know if 1 is congruent, then I should just look at the elliptic curve y squared equals x cubed minus x and calculate its rank. Having done so, we see that the rank of this curve is 0 and hence 1 is not a congruent number. That is to say that there is no right triangle with rational side lengths whose area is 1. Like so many things, this is a result that maybe was first proven by Fermat, although he didn't necessarily write it down super well. But in fact, actually, 1, 2, and 3 are all not congruent numbers. It is not possible to write down a rational right triangle whose area is 1, 2, or 3. And that can be proven by calculating the ranks of these curves. Now, 6 we decided was a congruent number, so let's check that if I actually write down this elliptic curve with n equals 6, that the rank really is at least greater than or equal to 1. 
Remember, by the way, that the curve is x cubed minus n squared x, so I need to put a 36 here if I want to look at this for 6. And so, indeed, we see that the rank here is 1, which is, well, greater than or equal to 1, and so that means that 6 is a congruent number, at least if you believe this weird theorem that I showed you. Of course, once the elliptic curve has rank greater than or equal to 1, you might be interested in figuring out, say, what the generator is. And here you can see that this point minus 3, 9 actually generates all of the points together with the torsion. None of this is especially impressive, and all was done well before there were computers. But here's a question that I want to ask. And this, I will definitely need the computer to answer. Is 157 a congruent number? That is, is there a right triangle with rational side lengths whose area is 157? Well, by the theorem, that's going to come down to understanding the rank of the curve y squared equals x cubed minus 157 squared x. So in other words, we need to decide is there a rational solution to this equation or not? Note, by the way, uh, if you take, for example, the solution where x is 0, which is definitely a solution to this equation, uh, it gives you a torsion point, so that doesn't affect the rank. I need a, a non-trivial solution to this equation. That's a pretty concrete question, but it's also a pretty hard question. But we can pull up Sage and say, hey, Sage, what's the rank of this elliptic curve? And when we do that, Sage will throw a giant fit and say, this curve is too complicated. Something weird happened and it'll give us some other suggestions uh, about what we might do in order to figure this out. Uh, and so basically Sage is saying, I'm not quite sure what the rank is. I ran this algorithm, I have to figure out what the rank is, and I can't figure it out. Now, if Sage isn't able to figure out the rank, you can probably guess it's also not going to be able to figure out the generators of this curve. And so what's happening here is really that Sage is genuinely unsure what is going on with this curve. Its algorithms are not quite working. Now, one thing we can do with Sage is we can change the way Sage makes these calculations. Currently, by default, Sage will only tell us things it can absolutely certainly prove. However, if we're willing to trust in conjectures and maybe some things that aren't 100% proven, we can basically ask Sage to guess what it thinks the rank of this curve is. And if we want to do that, we type as it actually suggests helpfully in the error message that we want to turn off only use MW rank. Basically, that's saying, okay, you can use unproven algorithms. And when you do that, what you see is that Sage guesses that the rank is 1. Now, you should take this guess really seriously. What Sage is doing here, really, is assuming that the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture is true, which is this thing we briefly touched on, but is basically a conjecture that, in fact, actually you can calculate the ranks of elliptic curves in a completely different way. And so as long as the Birch and Swinnerton Dyer conjecture is true, then the rank of this curve is 1. But keep in mind what that's saying is, if the rank of this curve is 1, there's some solution to this particular equation that one would hope we would be able to write down. And so maybe we're in this position where we have at least good evidence that this equation has a solution. We just don't know what that solution is. What's fortunate for me is that unlike Sage, I have the internet, so I can actually figure out what the rank of this curve really is and I can actually find out what the simplest point on it is. And as it happens, it's this. And you can see now that Sage has in fact checked for me that this point really is on the curve. Once you come up with this ridiculous point, however it is you actually go about coming up with it, 
You know this point can't be torsion, because remember, all torsion points have integer coordinates. So the mere fact that this is a point on the curve, which has coordinates that are not integers, tells me that the rank of this curve is at least 1, which, if you believe my theorem, tells me that 157 is a congruent number. Now, you might say that it's a bit odd to say that there's a right triangle with rational side lengths whose area is 157 without actually writing one down. But I tell you what, just for you, I'll run through the paper that proves this and translate this to a right triangle for you. So here are the A, B, and C that are the side lengths of a right triangle of area 157. Now, when I say that, I'm really making two claims. One is that the area of this triangle with these side lengths is 157. So let's check that. The area should be a half of A times B. So that works. And the other is that this triangle should really actually be a right triangle. That is, it should actually exist. And to check that, we have to check that the Pythagorean theorem holds. You probably don't think about this very often, but the Pythagorean theorem is actually an if and only if. If a squared plus b squared is c squared, that is sufficient to conclude that the triangle is a right triangle. So I should check here that a squared plus b squared really is c squared. So to do that, I'll go ahead and calculate a squared plus b squared minus c squared. And there, we can see that it works out to be zero, verifying that we have in fact found a right triangle of area 157, and we have in fact proved that this curve has rank at least one. It bears mentioning that this particular example was done with great effort by a mathematician named Don Zagier, with extensive help of computer search as well as a lot of very, very smart algorithms to look for this solution. So next up, let's talk about how to use Sage to work with an elliptic curve mod a prime. So to start with, I'm going to work mod the prime 101. I don't know why, just because. And I'm actually going to go back to our curve that we started with. So I'm going to look at y squared, and now it's x cubed minus 2x plus 21, but mod 101. So here's the command to do this. So it's almost the same as before, but we have to tell it first that we want to think about this mod 101. And so the sage command to say, think about this mod 101, is to put this GF 101 here at the front. If you're curious, GF stands in this case for Galois field. It's describing the integers mod 101. And so if you then ask Sage, hey, okay, I've defined this E, what is it I've done? Sage will then handily tell you, oh, hey, this is the elliptic curve with this equation over the field with 101 elements, which is just the integers mod 101. Now, I want to look at some points on this curve. So I'm just going to have Sage pick some random points on the curve. And so I'll go ahead and pick P and Q, and we'll just be random points on this particular curve. And so in this instance, Sage has generated the point 111 and the point 2764. And I will leave it to you to verify that 111 and 2764 are both really on this curve. As before, if we want to calculate p plus q or 2p or any multiple of p, we can just do that by typing the things that we would naturally think to type. Again, because we defined the elliptic curve here to be defined mod 101, Sage is automatically going to treat p and q as being on this elliptic curve mod 101. Now, as we've noted before, and as I'm showing you here, one key feature of an elliptic curve mod a prime is that as you add the point to itself over and over and over again, it doesn't get any more complicated. There are no denominators floating around here because there aren't any denominators mod 101. All the points on this curve just look like a number from 0 to 100, comma, another number from 0 to 100. So no matter how many times I add these points to themselves, or to each other, or whatever I do, it's not going to look any more complicated. 
even if I take this point and multiply it by 100 million like I did just there, it's still going to look just like all the other points. Now, as we've said before, the most important thing we want to know when we're looking at elliptic curve mod a prime is how many points there actually are on it. That is, of all of the possible combinations of two numbers mod 101, how many of them actually solve this equation? To calculate that, or to ask Sage to calculate that for us, we ask for the cardinality of the elliptic curve. That's just going to tell us the number of points. And so in this instance, we'll find that the cardinality is 112. There's 112 points on this curve. And if you want the factorization of 112, it's 16 times 7. This is a good opportunity to remember about the ve bound, which told us that if I look at the points on an elliptic curve, mod p, that the number of those points is going to be about p plus 1, and that the deviation is never going to be more than 2 times the square root of p. In this case, p plus 1, of course, is 102. Uh, square root of p is about 10, so certainly 112 is less than 20 more than 102. So we're in good shape. If you want just a little more evidence here to see that this works out, I've written a short little script here to make up some random elliptic curves mod 101 and spit out the number of points on them. You'll notice the largest number of points we got here was 120, which still is less than 2 times the square root of 101 more than 102, but it's getting very close. And in fact, actually, you'll always get, if you look across all the elliptic curves, as close as you could get. Of course, the number of points has to be an integer, and 2 times the square root of 101 is not an integer. But you'll get as close to that non-integer upper bound as you can. Okay, let's go back now to our curve E that's still our original curve E that we said had 112 points on it. Uh, and two of those points we said were P and Q. And so one thing that we were supposed to find was that the period of a point is always supposed to divide the number of points. Remember, that's what we called Fermat's little theorem for elliptic curves. The period of a point on an elliptic curve mod P always divides the number of points, being sure to count O as one of those points. And so one way to verify that that's the case is to multiply the point by the number of points. So in this case, I've calculated for you 112 times p. And so 112 times p, in this case it's telling me, is the identity element, and 112 times q is also the identity element. That's that point O, or the point at infinity, or whatever you want to call it. And so what this is saying is if I add yet one more to it, I'm going to go back to P again, or Q, and then repeat on forever. So this actually checks that the period really does divide 112. But maybe you don't love that, and maybe you'd like to see Sage actually calculate the period. And so the Sage word for period is dot additive order. The additive order is just the number of times you have to add it to itself to get back to the identity, or how often it's going to repeat. And so in this case, it actually turns out that both P and Q have period 14. 14 definitely divides 112, because remember that was 16 times 7. And so we're in good shape. We've checked our theorem. Now, in this case, both of our points ended up having period 14 which was rather small, if you want, you can actually ask for generators of the elliptic curve just the same way we did over Q. But now when we ask for generators, we're asking for something slightly different. Because remember, over Q, when we spoke about generators, we were saying, okay, take all the torsion points, and then the generators are the things I need beyond the torsion points in order to get all the points on the curve. Well, since I'm now working mod 101, all the points are torsion points. And so in particular, since all the points are torsion points, that means it wouldn't make any sense to ask for what points I need beyond the torsion points. And so instead, when you ask for generators, what you're really getting is a list of the points mod 101, that if you combine those, you'll get actually all the points mod 101. 
And so you'll see here it gives us two generators, 3710 and 2194. And so, if you like, we can actually calculate the periods of the generators, and you can see the first generator there actually has period 56, and that's actually the largest period that we can find on this particular curve. All right, so I think that covers just about all the things that we've done with elliptic curves and how to do them in SAGE. So all of these calculations that we've made and talked about, we should now be able to do at least for a lot of curves in SAGE without too much trouble. All right, so I'm gonna wrap this up here. There'll be a homework assignment where you get to put some of this into practice. But until then, have a good day, and I'll see you next time.